Welcome to the Lounge Audio YouTube channel. Today, we're going to get into the prehistory of the RIAA equalization curve. This is the next video in the series of RIAA equalization. I'm Robert, and let's get started. So, we got a comment on the last RIAA video by an Ellis Berman III. He's a member of the Hollywood Sapphire Group. I'm also a member of the Hollywood Sapphire Group. He reminded me about the history that the Hollywood Sapphire Group has to do with the RIAA curve. This is all before the Audio Engineering Society got involved in things. So we're going to start at the very beginning. This is the prehistory of the RIAA curve starting in 1942. So, Herman Widmar Rose, known as Wally. Now, he was a, an a and executive uh, doing talent scout type stuff and producing and developing uh, bands and, and, and singing acts, jazz stuff, 1920s and 1930s. Uh, very, very successful guy. Also, G.E. Stewart, now, I don't know what the G stands for and the E, couldn't find it anywhere on the net, but G.E. Stewart is a recording engineer at NBC. And Vin Liebler, who um, most notable that I could find is he worked in some capacity on Robert Johnson's uh, King of the Delta Blues album that was issued in the 19, beginning in the 1960s or 1970. So those three guys in 1942 would get together at a um, at some restaurant in New York, and they would have they would have lunch, and they got to talking about shop. What what would these guys talk about? Audio recording. So anyway, mostly what they were talking about was the different recording curves they had to deal with, and the different pressing standards of the uh, albums at the time, which were seventy eights. So anyway, they kept on having this lunch, meeting more uh, more and more often, and. And more people would show up. Other, you know, their other friends they work with would all start showing up. So finally, the group got so big that they had to, uh, they had to go in and uh, reschedule the thing for a dinner rather than a lunch, and make a formal, you know, scheduled meeting and reserve a room and all that because there's just too many people. That's the very beginning of what is called the Sapphire Group. By about 1945 there started to be some people showing up at the New York meeting that lived in Hollywood. By 1946, thereabouts, there's approximately eight or ten members that were showing up at the New York meeting, and they're from Hollywood. So when uh, they got to be that number of members, somebody decided there should be a Los Angeles chapter of the Sapphire Group. So a... Um, Chuck Phillips of OWI. OWI? I don't know what company that is. Anyway, he came over to Los Angeles and started what's called the Hollywood Sapphire Group. That was in 1946. Very soon, things would get quite a bit busy with this Hollywood Sapphire Group. Okay, so in March of 1948, Audio Engineering Magazine has two things going at once. We've got the Hollywood Sapphire Group figuring out about standardizing cutting curves and the announcement of the Audio Engineering Society. Now, Audio Engineering Magazine doesn't have anything to do with the Audio Engineering Society. So these are easy to get confused. So why don't you understand there's a trifecta going on here. The Audio Engineering Society, the Hollywood Sapphire Group, and Audio Engineering Magazine. So in the March of 48 issue, they talk about a meeting that the Sapphire Group had in December, in their December meeting. So what happened was, uh, at the end of the December meeting that the Hollywood Sapphire Group did, they all left a little bit hasty from meeting dinner and went over to the Altec Lansing Corporation review room to listen to a bunch of different uh, pressings they had. These were all beyond 78s. And uh, they're listening to all these pressings, trying to figure out 
which one they want to call a reference standard. So all these pressings are done at d different, uh, different mastering places, different kind of curves. They finally pick one of them and they're going to say, this one is the standard that we're going to use. What were they going to use them for? They started playing back their standard reference that they had just chosen through different phono stages. And they realized that all the phono stages were adjusted differently. You got all these different uh, cuttings they had that initially before they picked through things that were all different. They picked one reference, all these different phono stages, still getting different sound all the time. This is the point where everybody in the group was saying, we got to figure out how to standardize these things, how to make it so that all the mastering engineers are cutting to some kind of reference so that the albums all sound the same. So this is a pretty big deal. And this, this, uh, they, they wrote another paper, two members from this meeting that were at this meeting wrote another paper that came out a couple months later in Audio Engineering Magazine. And it was all about standardizing cutting, not just the curves, but dip, uh, width and depth and stuff in the cutting grooves. So anyway, at the same time though, you've got the announcement of the beginning of the Audio Engineering Society. So um, anyway, all this happens before there is the LP out. The LP, the 33 and a third RPM LP, is not a reality yet. It's coming soon, but it's not quite there yet. That throws a whole nother uh, cog in the, in, the, in, the, in the machine of all this cutting curve stuff. Okay, so now we're up to June of 1948. This is essentially the end of the Hollywood Sapphire Group being published in Audio Engineering Magazine. They're really not heard from much anymore in any publishing fashion. The meetings go on, for decades and decades, they still go on today. The first Tuesday of every month is the meeting for the Hollywood Sapphire Group. But as far as them having a presence in a publishing mode, there's, uh, there's no more. There's a picture in Audio Engineering Magazine, detailed description in the picture of all the members, a big, a big uh, uh, it was a second anniversary meeting. So it was a big spread of people. Everybody's got their name there, but there's no article about it. They're not, they don't talk about anything about what was talked about there or anything. There's just a mention that it's the second meeting, second anniversary meeting. From there, that's it for the Hollywood Sapphire Group being published in Audio Engineering Magazine. August 1948, Columbia announces the release of the first long playing album, the LP. It's the first time a bunch of songs could be put on one disc. There was other uh, attempts made before, but nothing like this. This changed everything radically. So um, when they did that, a number of smaller labels followed suit with Columbia. They, uh, they used their own cutting curves though. So you had these LPs with different curves all over the place. Um, also during this time, Audio Engineering Magazine is almost seems like it's being taken over by the Audio Engineering Society. There's so many articles by the Audio Engineering Society. Sapphire Group is gone basically from the magazine. And so you have the Columbia LP being released, Audio Engineering Society ballooning like crazy where, you, where you've got uh, different chapters in different cities, scholarly papers, peer reviewed papers being coming out all kinds of ABX listening tests, blind tests, all kinds of evaluations going on of equipment. So RCA in all of this was steadfastly holding out against releasing an LP. RCA held out and held out until 1950. They released their first LP. That first LP was called Genius at the Keyboard. It was cut from 78 masters, either clean 78s or from the mother metal master themselves. This is part of a series that RCA did called A Treasury of Immortal Performances. Everything in the early part of this series was the same, cut from 78 masters. Now, up to this time, Columbia had made about three 
million dollars. But at, and at this time, RCA had lost about $4.5 million. Also, RCA was in, was in jeopardy of losing artists, basically an artist rebellion. They were not happy with, with no LPs being released. So RCA has got the LP out finally. Now, fast forward to the mid-1950s. The RIAA decides to use whose cutting curve as the RIAA standard? RCA's. So foot dragging RCA gets to have the, a reward of their new orthophonic curve becoming the RIAA standard, pushing aside everybody else's cutting curve standard. There's RCA dragging its feet. They, they end up the winners. Don't know how that happened, but it did. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. We manufacture phono preamps and we sell them direct. See the link below.